Chamber of Commerce and their general sectorate and their rectors and their academicians of our university and their students and their guests. In the second program of the Science and Society meeting, you are all welcome about the journalism and the political relations and with the works that he did on this air, this field with the opening of a, our rector, the pr program will start and after that uh, Istanbul Chamber of Commerce, Council Board member and after that Professor Dr. Martin Luffelholz will make his speech and our rector Eugen Urlu is coming to the stage for the opening speech. Dear protocol of the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce and dear vice rectors, dear academicians, dear students, and dear other guests, I am salting you all with my sincere feelings. As Istanbul Technical University is the second meeting of society and science, in the first from Nevada University, Nafikitun with with us and in this series of conference two from Cambridge, one from Oxford and some from MIT with this kind of a series we design and with these presentations uh, to our main shareholders Istanbul Com Chamber of Commerce and with our own academicians and students we want to share the universities are not only giving service to their own students but also to the society they have responsibility and it's a social responsibility an academical responsibility and in this conference series we are going to continue it but it's not going to be uh, just a uh, one conference series in all of the faculties with their scope the, for the secondary in the summit of the professions, we will invite new academicians. There will be new program series in six of our faculties with different programs we will have. Today in this organization, uh, firstly to, to the Professor Dr. Leffenholz, we are very thankful for accepting this invitation, but to the communication faculty and uh, also, the, the dean of the faculty, we are very thankful. In our university, with uh, chains, uh, there are series of chains, and it's just one part of these chains, and I hope it's going to continue in beneficial way, and to our students and to academicians, we are very thankful to all of you. You are all welcome. To our rector, we are very thankful for his speech. And now, from Istanbul Chamber of Commerce, the Vice President of Council Board, Ismail Krolay, is coming to stage for his speech. Dear rector, and dear vice rectors, and dear academicians, and Dear my academician and dear friends, I'm salting you all with my sincere feelings also as Istanbul Chamber of Commerce with this kind of organization. I'm very happy to have this kind of organization and for me this meeting, this program is very meaningful for me. I'm very excited uh, and as a one that talking too much, uh, this kind of program is very meaningful me uh, I am also a doctorate student in the Istanbul Commerce University my uh, academicians are here so it's more meaningful for me my classmates are here so we are trying to do this work I'm going to end my thesis I need to remind you it's a very important program today. Professor Dr. Martin Leffelholz is here with his information. With he, He's going to enlighten us. And one of the biggest problems in the world is communication. The unable to communicate 
everyone is looking to the problems from their place. They are not making much empathy. They are with their own voice they are looking to the problems so there are big problems we are living with problems because of it so communication is very important in this topic we need our academicians in this topic and with our academicians in our university we are talking about it very much quality and quantity uh, there is a niche change in the communication and the traditional communication methods are being and and new ways are being opened but how are they going to transform it's important especially being a chamber of commerce the new communication how it will be organized in an economical way how it will get gains we we say that traditional communication is going to end but how new communication methods are going to be traditions if we can say it's like the carpet is taken from our below so we are in an empty place for the benefits of the people for the humanity we should feel it with this meaning I think this program is very important and to our academician I, it, they have lots of effort in this organization for improving our communication for improving the communication science I know that he is going to give us lots of in important information and uh, from the also the Board of Higher Education it's approved what kind of culture works will be done with these uh, with a strong university if there is why we can't create a Istanbul school with the West and East information and combining. We are in this kind of city. Uh, this city is very good source for the West, East and Middle East and with religions and languages and with geographies. It's that kind of a geography that all of them meet. So improving them is very important from here. I hope this meeting is going to be beneficial. First to our rector, vice rectors and dean of the communication faculty and to our academicians. I'm very thankful to you all to to also Martin, Professor Dr. Martin Lefelos. I'm very thankful this program is going to be continue. I'm sending you my deepest respects. <laughs> thankful and now professor doctor before inviting professor doctor martin Lefelos, i'm going to make a summary of his biography and uh, he is the director of the communication faculty and also the as a research president of the media unities and till 2010 with the ilmenel for the he is the president of the public policy and Professor Dr. Martin Leffel Hals is with the Alexander von Holt Foundation. He is, he is the one that got award from there and in the works from the 1988 with a doctorate degree on the 1998 in the Musta and the Leipzig universities he worked in the Ilmenau Technical University after he started to work here uh, on the 1999 uh, he was being declared as a founder director and in the other countries also he did a guest profes professorship and between 2012 and 2015 in the Indonesia Jakarta in the Swiss German University he left the position of the academician and after that with the publications in the international way with the journeyman and for the communication communi communications and in the science communications he worked and with the German communication foundation with this kind of foundation he is member and between 1997 and 2000 he did a directorship in the digital book and he became the founder after that and and professor Doc, dr leffelholz in the 
foreign affairs and foreign institutions. He did an expertise there, and for 30 years, different services are given by him and his works in Africa, in Asia, and in the Middle East countries he always been. And before starting to the university career, in a in a gazette he worked and he was also a reporter and he did his military also military service and dear guests right now we are inviting Professor Dr. Martin Leffelholz to the stage for his speech. Be here with you and um, I feel a little bit ashamed here when you're getting older the CV is unfortunately old, also getting older here. Yeah? So, yeah, thank you very much for the very warm welcome. Um, the Vice President, Director, and all the esteemed guests. Um, I heard there are also many academicians here, PhD students. Um, what, I, what I would like to do here is uh, to give a kind of overview on some current trends in communication and in communication science. In fact, the topic given to me was uh, very broad. Trends in communication science is really a very uh, diverse field, so I have to focus on a number of, of most relevant trends. And what I'm, what I'm doing here, I would like to focus on mainly three um, developments, which from my perspective are very important already, particularly the hybridization related to social media. Um, second, the, what we call virtualization related to the virtual and mixed realities. And third, and I think that is the most profound change, the um, algorithmization and automation of communication, which is closely linked to what we call and what computer scientists call artificial intelligence. Um, as you can see, this is a very broad field, so I'll give an overview. And after my talk, probably 25 minutes or so, we'll still have some minutes for Q&A, for question and answer. So if you have question or if you ever have remarks, please feel free a little bit later to uh, ask and to be part of the conversation. So. Let's start with the, with the first one. And what I'm showing here is a chart which has been developed in Japan. Um, in fact, by the Japanese Chamber of Commerce, which is very closely uh, related also to the academic world. Same what I learned here with uh, the Chamber of Commerce here, where we are right now, with the Chicharet University. So there are some similarities. Uh, Japan has been very innovative, as you know, uh, already decades ago. And they have been creating a term which they called, which academicians called, the information society. And now the question, which is discussed in Japan, which is discussed now all across the world, the question is, what's coming next? What is our society right now? Um, we don't really know how to call this. And uh, you can see here, because they don't have a name, they simply call it Society 5.0. Uh, because it's based on the fourth industrial revolution, so creating the fifth new form of society. In fact, I'm a bit skeptical to always believe that societies are totally changing. When we have seen the uh, what they call the development from the industrialized society to the post-industrial society. Daniel Bell and others have been writing about that. Or what they have been calling 30, 40 years ago, uh, starting in the mid-60s of the last century, the information society. We learned that many mechanisms of this so-called new society were still in place. The market is still there. The companies, the corporations are still there. The mechanisms of business and finance are still there. However, they are entirely affected and partly changed 
by these new trends. So on the one hand, there is some kind of stable societal, political, economic, cultural environment. On the other hand, there are huge changes. And we have to talk and keep into consideration, into account, both. So it's not just a totally different future. It's a future which is based on what we have been experiences, meaning from the, let's say, perspective of competence, qualifications, as usual, we always need a combination of the older, I hope, also me, and the young generation, definitely. So um, what, what has been um, discussed um, related to the Society 5.0 is what I would simply call, because we don't have a better name at the moment, the post-information society. It's still based on many ideas of the information society. One of these ideas is that information and communication are becoming a resource in economy, in different fields, same like capital, uh, human resources, and others. Uh, so information has already become a very important uh, resource for development. And now, what's the next resource which has to be added? And some people say this is closely related to the development of artificial intelligence. Are we creating, are we creating a world without humans? Do we have to call the next form of society a post-human society? I don't believe that, and particularly I don't hope for that. But it's in our hands. And I will talk a little bit later a bit more on these, on these questions. So a second term, which probably many of you are already familiar, is the term risk society. I don't go into the details here, but I want to mention this concept of uh, German sociologist Ulrich Beck, who developed that idea in the uh, 1980s. And he wrote this book, Risk Society, just before Chernobyl happened, the nuclear disaster in the, by that time, USSR. And it happened in 1986. I still remember that day when I was walking with friends in the forest and some people said, why don't you cover? To put the idea of risk society, to bring it to just one point, the, the main idea of Ulrich Beck is that modernization, the change of society, is at the same time creating positive effects, higher productivity, for instance. But by doing so, this process of modernization is also creating more risks. And these risks can, they don't have to, but they can, influence the process of modernization itself. That's why they call it nowadays a risk society. So this is a process what Ulrich Beck and others have been calling reflexive modernization. The modernization process is influencing itself. Meaning, what does it mean for our topic here, the development of communication? The modernization process, social media, Virtual, uh, virtual environments, automation of communication can, they don't have to, but it can negatively influence us. So we should not only think about the, let's say, opportunities, we also have to take into account the obstacles, the problems. We have to be smart. We have to foresee what's happening. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we are talking not about the societal uh, development. We are talking about the development of communication, of communication science. Communication science is a relatively young discipline. <coughs> excuse, uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, it's okay, thank you. I, I had a cold, but now it's okay. So it's just a little bit, uh, but it's okay. I can handle this. So the the, uh, the communication science has developed over a period of about 100 plus years in different countries with different pace. And now we are having a quite stable 
innovative discipline. Especially since the 1940s and 50s, we have adapted research methodologies from the natural sciences, from technology. So we are, most of us, are related to the empirical analytical paradigm. We are not just guessing. We don't just want to guess and simply understand subjectively what's happening, but we want to test it. We want to test uh, realities. We want to test hypotheses. This has created a situation in communication science, without going into detail here, that we now have a complex, um, um, a complex portfolio of theories. We have many well-tested methodologies, research methods, so we are able to do creative research. What's the problem here? The problem is all of this has been created in the 20th century under the circumstances of mass media, classical mass media. And now we are struggling to utilize our theories, our methodologies for the new world of communication, for what we call the hybrid media system. That is one of the huge challenges we are facing in communication science. The second challenge is related to the speed, to the pace of innovation. Could you imagine printing press, Johannes Gutenberg and others? It took hundreds of years until we have developed the forms of newspapers and journals which we have now. Then TV took about 100 years, radio more or less similar, cinema, all of this took decades or even centuries to develop. How about the social media? It has a history of 15 years. What does it mean related to communication science? For us in, in, in communication studies, it's not easy to keep up the pace. And the same applies to the industry. So this is another huge challenge we have to deal with, meaning we need more flexibility in university systems regarding the topics we are teaching. We cannot create a subject and then teach this subject for 20 years. Maybe it's absolutely invalid in, within eight years. There's always new developments in the social media world and in other areas. So we'll, we'll have to uh, take these obstacles, these challenges, we have to take those into consideration. So that's what I already described. Um, the history of communication science, the recent history, has been dealing with digitalization. I think we are all familiar with that. That is a process which is the base for all of what we are talking about now. Digitalization has created a totally new world, uh, which is now still affecting us. This is uh, the one of the first desktop computers. Uh, the next trend is what we call the hybridization. Hybridization means that the internet and all the media, the new platforms based on the internet, are now in close contact, close links with the classical, traditional, legacy media world of TV, radio, and newspapers. And then, yeah, you are all familiar with the term big data. So the next huge process, which started already more or less 20 years ago, is the datafication. Google and many other companies are the pioneers in this world. Datafication means that all processes which could be um, transferred into a digital language, could be digitized, are being digitized. And that is creating data. And sometimes, nowadays, it seems weird what kind of data <coughs> is being collected. So more and more processes, human activities, also natural activities, are being transformed into the virtual world of data. This process is what we call datafication. And now we are now in this stage of the, yeah, some still call it um, the internet of things. It's not the internet of things anymore. 
we have to talk about the internet of everything, meaning literally everything can be connected to the internet. I will give you a few examples later. Based on these huge set of data, structured and unstructured data, it is possible, and we are working on that, to automate creative work. Um, when I was a journalist in the 80s, first print journalist and later a TV journalist, we never ever believed that what has been happening in the world of industry, robots, automation, etc., could affect us. It affected our colleagues in the printing press, but we, arrogantly, the journalists, we are creative. No computer can do that. No robot can do that. Now we have to learn it's not true. We were wrong. I mean, all of us in that generation. So the internet of everything, literally everything could be connected with each other. So you see here a chart uh, showing how different types of devices are connected to the internet. I will give you a bit strange example. Do you think we need a restroom, or make it clear, a toilet to be connected to the internet? I mean, I'm not talking about us in the restroom using our phone. I'm talking about the tool, the toilet, connected to the internet. It's there. Do you think we need to innovate to, f to find it? No, it's already there. It's not widely used for some reason. And what is the advantage of that? Uh, this tool can directly check the data of, uh, let's say, a person who is sick, maybe problem with the kidney, problem with the liver, and this data can be directly sent to, let's say, your doctor. The destabilization of communication uh, systems has a number of, of negative impact, and I think you are familiar with all of these uh, trends, so uh, sometimes stories are getting viral even though they are wrong, they have a low level of quality. Um, if we are living in a, let's say, authoritarian communication system, we can control it. If we are living in a more open society, it's very difficult. Um, social first heightens the risk of errors. In journalism and in some other professions related to the production of information, many people are willing, because of the tight competition, new competitors, new communicators um, are entering these this new communication systems. Um, they are producing or they are publishing their information first on the social media. And there is a lack of double checking as it was happening in the old world of classical media. And so there are several other, um, other, let's say, obstacles or problems we have to deal with. A very important one is also the so-called deep fakes. Technically, we can already fake a video. So I could show you a video, um, maybe with me as an actor, but it's not me. Someone has faked it. But it's my voice, it's my face, but I've never been in front of a camera. Deep fakes. So these are high risks which are affecting the world of politics and also, of course, the, the world of commerce and business. The second trend, virtualization and mixed realities. Um, here in, in, in Ilmenau, the university where I'm coming from, we have a virtual reality lab. We are dealing with that. Uh, in our Institute for Communication Studies, Social Science Oriented Institute, we have a professor, one department, coming from informatics. We have integrated that 20 years ago. I was the founding director, it was already mentioned. We are convinced, fully convinced, that this is necessary. We have to bring these worlds closer together to uh, experiment with these new virtual environments. Um, I show you a few pictures here. Um, this one is quite interesting. Uh, one of our uh, former assistants has written the dissertation, the doctorate thesis, on the impact of these uh, virtual, um, let's say, classrooms. So for lecturers, you could go into this virtual environment. You're standing in a room, 
but in, if you are standing in front of this uh, virtual audience, you are alone, but then you can speak and then you will get reactions from the audience and you can experiment your rhetorics, just as an example. Um, virtual realities have a number of characteristics, immersion, the capability of uh, virtual reality systems to deliver vivid illusions to senses of human participants so that we are convinced that this is a kind of reality. Uh, presence and, of course, interactivity. Interactivity refers to the ability of the human who is engaged in this world to deal with it. Those who are doing computer games know what I mean. You, know, you can change the virtual, um, the virtual realities by your own actions. The computer game industry is a pioneer in this field. This world does not, is, is now entering also other professional fields, architecture, interior design, and many other areas. Um, maybe I should show you a, a, one of the examples of virtual reality in journalism. Uh, created by one of the pioneers, uh, Noni de, de la Peña. It's a short clip, but um, let me just show you very briefly. Noni de la Peña is using video game technology to tell stories in an entirely new way. In part of Syria, I just put in the middle of the street when a bomb goes off, just like what happened in the real day. Known as immersive journalism, the medium allows audiences to enter the story. I wanted to put them in, in, in the place that I always want to be as a journalist, like boots on the ground, write a little story, I understand what's happening. It's been amazing to me how emotional it is for people. I feel like I get um, stronger reactions now in the pieces that I build. I will, st I will stop it here. Um, you can see, find this clip in YouTube here, so Noni, uh, Noni de la Peña has published already a lot also, and short clips, etc. Um, I'm not sure whether you have noticed, at the beginning it was a real, um, a a real um, um, camera shooting. Uh, so we saw this girl, and then when the, when the, when the bomb or attack happened, they turned into a, a virtual environment. We call these mixed realities. Yeah, so this is now an, an, a very important trend in the world of um, visualization. Um, yeah, why do we use this? Uh, um, we are using it because it's uh, opening up new channels for our understanding. We are. Um, we are uh, visual persons, most of us, majority of us, so if we are able to uh, enter into these visual worlds without being really there, uh, then we have new opportunities for uh, communication. The research on this matter has started a few years ago on media effects. Uh, the, the emotions were, were mentioned in the video. Uh, so, and there was, uh, there's also a very interesting dissertation. I'm, I, I mentioned it from our uh, former assistant, uh, Maria Dubiago from Ilmenau University. She has uh, published uh, on, and created also a teaching, um, um, continuing education uh, classes on these, on these matters. So now, um, yeah, the last trend, and I think the most important. Why is it the most important, algorithmization and automation? My feeling, my instinct, it's not an objective uh, statement what I'm now making. Um, is that what's happening right now in this field of algorithmization, automation, and artificial intelligence is probably as important or even more important than the invention of the publishing press happened in the 15th century. That is, I think, the dimension we are talking about. Do we notice it? No, because this is, uh, it's not that visible. Not many people are aware of this. And what are we talking about? So one of the producers of computer software for journalism, narrative science, uh, are claiming that 90% of news content very recently will be generated automatically. So the question is, who has been writing the news? The human 
or the robot. So what do you think? You can read that, right? To keep it short, it's not written by a human. This news was written by a robot. Uh, is it just an experiment? No. It was, uh, it's, uh, it's, let's say, um, artificial intelligence or a certain software which has been writing already tens of thousands of articles. And this is happening every day in many countries of the world. Is it a good development? Oh, yeah. I've been working as a journalist many years, and in my younger years, um, I didn't really like to write typical short news. It's boring. I wanted to go out, reportage, right, do these creative stories. So I'm happy if um, artificial intelligence or certain software is writing all the routine work. Will it be limited to that? No. At the moment, yes. Most of these stories written by computers, by machines, by software, are based on data. We need data. And these data are combined in a certain way, following certain algorithms into the form of news. Many news agencies, Bloomberg and others, are using that. So this is a definition. Um, so um, automated journalism is referring uh, to the um, um, relationship between uh, the product and the software. So most of the uh, or all of the, uh, of the news article has been uh, created by the software uh, without any um, influence of a human being during that process. The only influence was the programming. The software has been programmed. If you're interested, uh, you can uh, have an, I think this is a quite good book published in 2016 on automated journalism, a guide to automated journalism. Uh, it's quite recent. It's giving an overview on these developments by Andreas uh, Grefer. You can find it uh, for free in the, in the um, hybrid media system in the internet. Um, automated journalism is following more or less the same steps like classical journalism. We have to collect the information. They collect the data. This, um, we have to identify the most important issues. We have to set priorities. We have to generate the article, produce the article. In earlier years, we have been writing it. Now the computer is writing it, and then it will be published. So quite simple. But of course, the interesting thing is here, what kind of software is doing that? And these are some examples of media organizations using that. But it's now already a very long list. In some countries, like in the US, you have to uh, inform your readership about the uh, source of the article. So whether it's developed by human or, let's say, a software. In Germany, no. There is no legal base for that. You can just publish anything which has been written by the software. So this is uh, from, uh, you are a lawyer. So this is, uh, this is also creating questions related to policy, to governance, uh, to, the law, to the legal system. And it's still in, in the, let's say, in, 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 a, in a huge flow. It's not only limited, automation it not, is not only limited to journalism. It's affecting the entire world of communication. Um, this chart is identifying different levels of our, the use of algorithms and artificial intelligence in communication. So white and green means the the influence of artificial intelligence and, um, auto, um, and automation is relatively simple. Uh, the, the orange and red colors indicate that it's quite difficult nowadays, still difficult, to use a software to replace or support the respective pro process. So the more a communication process is based on complex information, cannot be simply datafied. The more difficult also, which is logical, uh, to use an artificial uh, intelligence or a process of automation. I think I mentioned that already, so we can uh, move forward fast. Um, all of this is based on datafication. Without the data, it wouldn't happen. 
The datification is reality. I haven't mentioned one obstacle. Many of the data which are available are not transparent. We, we can't access them. Do you know when you are Googling, do you know how the results are created? No. Of course, some of you guys, um, there are some specialists, they do the optimization of Google search or uh, optimization of, the, of other search engines. So they know some of the parameter used by Google, but the real uh, source code of this is not known. It's private. We don't have access. Is that okay? Yeah, from the perspective of the market, private business, yes. However, the influence of that is immense, it's huge. So it's becoming also a political issue. So that is, of course, still uh, uh, um, under the, uh, under, under, yeah, it's still debated. Um, the automation, or let's say the algorithmization of communication is affecting all aspects of communication. Qualification, forms of labor, products, authority, and many other aspects, even the perception, transparency uh, issues, I mentioned that already. Um, reflexive modernization, this has opportunities, same like other trends, but also, um, um, let's say, obstacles, problems. Uh, one is the algorithmic, uh, algorithmic bias. When you, when you use the search term CEO, of course, it depends in what country, etc. But when you use the search term CEO, you find these pictures if you make an e image search. And do you see something there? It's all male. Just one example. Probably if some others will search, because the algorithm is also based on your previous search. Another, another example. I've been living a couple of years in Indonesia, in Jakarta, where I was uh, president of university. So I'm interested, still interested, what's going on there. There was uh, an earthquake in Lombok, in, 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 uh, close to Bali. And um, in Bahasa Indonesia, in the Indonesian language, the word selamat is used for greetings. It has a positive meaning. The earthquake happens, and many people expressed their sorrow uh, by using an, a spe specific term in I Indonesian language, which were also including the word selamat. But the Facebook was not aware of that. So when the people expressed their sorrow, that they are so sad that relatives have passed away and that they were hoping that some are still alive, when you, when you entered Facebook to express these, these feelings of your emotional feelings of sadness, etc., suddenly wonderful colored balloons came up, which have, of course, like, you know, party feeling, yeah? And of course, it was a disaster, a communication disaster. Yeah, so Facebook has changed that algorithm already. The last example, maybe you have heard of Thai, an artificial, a preform of artificial uh, intelligence, which was used by Microsoft. Microsoft launched this uh, artificial intelligence, the name is Thai, some, some time ago, some years ago. And this machine, this software was trained to improve itself, deep learning, using, using examples of what the machine was able to observe to train itself and improve. So this, this software was trained to double check, let's say, social media, the communication of us, of humans, and very fast, within a few days or weeks, Thai became racist, became um, sexist, because most of the communication the machine has been analyzing, created by hu the wonderful human, humans like us, were racist and sexist. So the machine was learning from that. And then, of course, it was another scam. These are just a very few examples of the reflexive modernization. I want to come to an end to conclude, uh, give a very brief outlook. So um, from my perspective, we are living in three interconnected forms of public sphere, which are still valid. We still have the 
classical mediated public sphere. There are still people there. They just follow the news in the TV, and they are sitting on the couch. Uh, they are drinking a cup of chai, and they follow the series in the TV. Classical mediated public sphere. Second, we have, and many people now also part of that, we have this hybrid public sphere, which I already described. So they are using not just simply classical mass media, but also social media. And they also aware that classical mass media and participatory or social media are also interconnected. Many classical media channels also offer social media channels. Yeah, so we have this hybrid public sphere. That is our reality right now for most of us. But the next form of public sphere is already underway. That is what I call a compute computational public sphere. Machines are communicating with humans. Is that science fiction? No, it's already happening. You have heard the term social bots. And it has influenced politics, for instance, in the US. So that's a software which is automatically reacting when a human is posting social bots. Of course, it has to be programmed. And then what, is, what are the next steps? We have to discuss. Are we in the humanities, in the social sciences, in detail informed about that? No. Are our colleagues from the computer sciences, do they know all these trends related to content to the different disciplines? I doubt. So we need to work together much closer than we have been doing that before. So for communication science, I think we have one obstacle, I mentioned that already, we are still deeply rooted in the 20th century. Many of the classes of the programs offered are still following the old classical mass media approach. Partly they are also engaging into social media, but not sufficiently. Many series, methodologies used have been, have, do have this, her, their roots in the 20th century. We have to work hard to really improve that. There is some work done, but it's absolutely not a finished business. Hybridization, algorithmization, artificial intelligence, um, of course, we can, we can discuss that. These developments have a huge impact, probably more than other media innovations before. So we have to prioritize our research and our teaching in these fields. OK, it's fine if we still have film studies and others. It's important. But we really need many more colleagues working in these areas. And um, yeah, last comment. Um, what I feel, I have mentioned it now several times, um, what we have started in, in Ilmenau, what um, Istanbul Ticaret um, University here in Istanbul is now planning, a new institute on communication science and the internet, these are the trendsetters and these are important developments in the field of communication science or in the field of the social sciences. So I feel we really have to work on that. We need to work closer with informatics, computer science, data science, and we have to find ways to interconnect with each other. In Ilmenau, we have 20 years of experience, not only positive, it's sometimes very hard when it comes to the details, because these are different worlds, academically speaking. However, there is already a new field which we call computational communication science. Two years ago, I'm, I'm also now the current director of the institute. I was the founding director, and now I'm, since I'm back from Jakarta, I, my colleagues made me director again. Um, and two years ago, we have created a new unit in our institute, a new department, Computational Communication Science, run by a young communication scholar who has also an understanding of computer science and data science. And um, this is the, um, the department. This is my colleague, Professor Domahidi. And um, she has written a very interesting article, if you're interested in these fields, to go into more details of methodology and theory. Uh, you should have a look in the recent uh, uh, issue of the International Journal of Communication. Emesha Domahidi has written together with some articles an overview on the developments in the field. 
and has uh, also edited this volume, which is contributing um, innovatively to this situation. Thank you very much, Teshikure Rim. I'm very happy for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sayın Profesör Dr. Martin Lefelhoff. To Professor Dr. Martin Lefelhoff, we are very thankful and for our institution, to our communication faculty, to our doctorate students. I am very thankful in this organization to the everyone that having support, effort, and to the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce and to the Israf, Mr. Istafil and. To everyone that have an effort, to everyone working here, I'm very thankful. And about one more topic, I want to say that in the, in the Institute of Communication and Internet Institute, in the establishment of from Mr. Martin Leffelholz, we get lots of benefits in the establishment of this institute. And in the idea, he is the architects of this institute, and in the also, the Professor Dr. Fusun, we are very really thankful and thankful to all of them. And this institute, in the next days, in the internet and in the information, will make lots of important research works. And to the communication sciences internet field, will make articles. I'm so thank you all with my deepest respects for your participations. I'm very happy. Thank you.